Good morning, or maybe it is good afternoon where you are. Welcome to the Anticoagulation Forum's June 2022 webinar on the implementation of anticoagulation stewardship programs, the future of anticoagulation care. Uh, my name is Andrea Van Beek, and I am joined today by an elite panel of anticoagulation specialists who have been recently focusing their work on anticoagulation stewardship. I think we all stand to learn a great deal from them over the next hour, so fasten your seatbelts. Today, our panel of presenters include Dr. Dan Budnitz. Dr. Budnitz is a director of the Medication Safety Program in the Division of Healthcare Quality Promotion for the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. He is also a member of the AC Forum Board of Directors and is our government liaison. Uh, next, we have myself, Andrea Van Beek, and I am an anticoagulation clinic nurse practitioner at Visalia Medical Clinic, Kauia Health Medical Group. Dr. Catherine Dane is joining us as well, and she is a clinical pharmacist in the Department of Benign Hematology and Cardiology at the Johns Hopkins Hospital. We also have Dr. Michael Streif, a professor of medicine at Johns Hopkins University. Uh, Katie and Mike are both on the anticoagulation stewardship team at Johns Hopkins. Um, additionally, we have Dr. Jory May, a physician and assistant professor at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. We also have Ann Rose, a pharmacist and pharmacy manager at UW Health. Uh, Ann is a mentor for the University of Alabama site. And last, but certainly not least, we have Dr. Scott Cates, and he is a hospitalist at Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit. Um, Dr. Cates is our immediate past president of the AC Forum, and he is also a mentor for the University of Alabama site. This slide contains our disclosures for your review. To claim credit for today's webinar, please go to the web address provided on this screen and select today's webinar. You'll need to evaluate the program and then you will be able to print a certificate for your records. So next it's time to jump in, but first I'd like to give you a bit of background on why we selected the topic of anticoagulation stewardship programs for this month's webinar. Uh, Dan and his colleagues at the CDC published a paper in JAMA in 2021 describing U.S. emergency department visits attributed to medication harms in the U.S. As Dan will describe, he and his colleagues found that anticoagulants are five of the top 10 drugs leading to adverse drug events, and they discovered nearly as many visits are attributed to DOAX as to warfarin. In 2019, the Joint Commission updated its national patient safety goals to specifically address DOAX and their management, and concurrently, the AC Forum was working to elevate efforts around anticoagulation stewardship. And we did so by modeling after the very successful antibiotic stewardship model. The AC Forum worked with the FDA to develop the core elements of anticoagulation stewardship, and we recently worked with NQF to develop the new anticoagulation stewardship playbook set to be released this September. Uh, last year, the Anticoagulation Forum worked with several pilot sites by providing mentors to assist with the development of anticoagulation stewardship programs, including the University of Alabama. Alabama, who will be describing their program today. Uh, Johns Hopkins also created their own anticoagulation stewardship program, and they will give us some background as well. As we go through the presentations, please feel free to type your questions in the Q&A box, and we will be fielding those at the end of our hour together. And now I will turn it over to you, Dan. Take it away. Great. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to give a good afternoon to everyone uh, online. I'm going to begin the presentations today by providing some background on why we need anticoagulation stewardship programs. And a little spoiler alert, the short answer is that of all types of adverse drug events, if I could magically eliminate just one of these, without question, I would eliminate anticoagulant-related complications. And while we all know it's hard to do, optimizing anticoagulation management through stewardship programs is an exceptional opportunity to measurably improve medication safety. And next slide. And we can go to the next slide. So let me start by providing some background statistics to demonstrate how common, clinically significant, and costly adverse drug events overall are. Now, adverse drug events, which I'll sometimes refer to as ADEs, impact about 1.9 million hospital stays each year. When they occur, they add between 1.7 and 4.6 days to a hospitalization. And 
ADEs from just the top two drug classes, anticoagulants and diabetes drugs, cost more than $5 billion annually. ADEs are also the most common complication during patients' transition out of the hospital. Adverse drug events are involved in two-thirds of all discharge complications, and they're involved in one-half of discharge complications that are deemed preventable. And in the outpatient setting, adverse drug events lead to 3.5 million outpatient visits each year, 1.3 million emergency department visits each year, and about 350,000 hospitalizations. Next slide. Now, returning to the hospital setting, if we consider all types of iatrogenic harm to patients, such as hospital acquired infections, procedural complications, pressure ulcers, we find that ADEs were the most common cause of iatrogenic harm to hospitalized patients in the 2000s and 2010s. Based on a landmark 2010 Office of the Inspector General report of Medicare patients, ADEs caused 33% of iatrogenic events in hospitalized patients. And ADEs were the most common cause of iatrogenic mortality in these patients. Now, just last month, the Department of Health and Human Services Office of the Inspector General released a follow-up study to this classic report, and again found that medications cause more of the most adverse events, now up to 43% of all iatrogenic harms. And again, anticoagulants were the most commonly implicated class of medications causing these harms. There, its recommendations of this Inspector General report include tailoring the scope of interventions to reducing the types of patient harm they identified, and calling for new toolkits and resources for providers to address the most common harms. Thus, based on their findings across all types of atrogenic harm, they're essentially calling for better anticoagulation management and stewardship. Now, these data were based on studying hospitalized older adults, but when similar studies were done in long-term care hospitals, skilled nursing facilities, rehabilitation hospitals, the results were strikingly similar. Medications with most common cause of iatrogenic harms in these additional settings and any coagulants were either the first or second most common class implicated. And when each adverse event was examined, any any coagulation ADEs were all clinically significant events that contributed to deaths or resulted in prolonged hospitalizations. It's been estimated that anticoagulant ADEs, if they occur, add an average of 10,000 in hospital costs in patient stays for an estimated 2.5 billion in costs each year across the US. And the latest Inspector General's report found essentially the same results. Anticoagulants continue to be the leading cause of adverse drug events, causing clinically significant patient harms. And as you all know, and as you can see by these brief case summaries, these are often complicated cases and not all events are preventable. Nonetheless, anticoagulation management is where there continues to be significant opportunity for improvement in patient safety. Now I'm gonna take a look at the most recent data on outpatient adverse drug events. On the left-hand side of the chart, we see a little bit older data about the leading causes of ED visits for adverse drug events in the early 2010s. And warfarin was the leading cause of ED visits for ADEs causing 15% or one out of every six to seven ED visits for adverse drug events. And we see rivaroxaban was the 10th most common drug implicated in these ED visits for ADEs. Now on the right-hand side of the slide, we see the most recent study of ED visits for adverse drug events based on data from the end of the 2010s up to 2019. The number of ED visits for warfarin did decline, but warfarin remained the number one cause of ED visits for adverse events. On the other hand, rivaroxaban had risen to the sixth leading cause, and apixaban had passed rivaroxaban to take the number five spot. And when we look specifically at older adults, our most susceptible patients, we find anticoagulants cause an even greater proportion of ED visits for adverse drug events. Again, on the left-hand side, in the early 2010s, oral anticoagulants, warfarin, rivaroxaban, and dabigatran were involved in over one-third of all ED visits for ADEs among those 65 years and older. And similar to the trend in all ages combined, in the late 2010s, the percentage of ED visits for ADEs due to warfarin declined, but the overall number including apixaban and rivaroxaban actually increased. Next slide. Now, when we look at the most serious outpatient ADEs, those that lead to emergent hospitalizations in patients, again, we see warfarin remains at the top of the list of implicated medications. 
And for patients 65 and older, five out of the 13 most common drugs leading to emergent hospitalization for ADEs were anticoagulants. Now this figure graphically shows how anticoagulants as a class have continued to be the leading cause of emergent hospitalizations for ADEs throughout the 2010s, both for adults of all ages on the left, and even more so for older adults, causing 40 to 55% of acute ADEs leading to emergent hospitalization. And in this final slide of data, I've updated a figure that we presented at last year's AC Forum National Conference to take us into the current decade. As you can see, considering the DOACs altogether, the number of ED visits for DOAC-related bleeding has now definitively surpassed the number of ED visits for warfarin-related bleeding. So a new challenge for us. And so in summary, I just want to iterate three key points. Medications are the most common cause of iatrogenic harm to our patients. And anticoagulants are the number one, or sometimes number two, most common cause of medication-related iatrogenic harm in most inpatient healthcare settings. Patient harms from direct acting oral anticoagulants are becoming, or rather actually have become, more common than harms from warfarin among our outpatients. And I think these are key points that I'd like to uh, 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 make as we continue with the rest of our presentations. So now I'll turn over the presentation to Katie Dane, who will share her, experiencing, uh, her experience developing and implementing hemostatic and thrombotic stewardship programs at Johns Hopkins. Thanks very much, Dan, for sharing your work, which really provided a great um, overview of the evidence supporting the need for anticoagulation stewardship programs. And that data really sets the stage nicely for my portion, which is focused on reviewing the structure and implementation process for the multidisciplinary stewardship program at my institution, the Johns Hopkins Hospital. Although Dan's data focused largely on anticoagulation safety, anticoagulants go hand in hand with hemostatic agents, such as clotting factor concentrates, which are, of course, significantly more costly than anticoagulants. The initial rationale and support for developing a stewardship program here at JHH came from increased awareness of the high cost and overall spend on clotting factor concentrates after we transitioned the dispensing function and financial responsibility for these products from the blood bank to the pharmacy department. In FY17, which was the year prior to implementing our stewardship program, we spent just under $7 million on factor concentrate products. And based on the return on investment estimated from published data from other well-established stewardship programs, such as UNC, and the high expenditure on clotting factor concentrates at JHH, pharmacy and hematology leadership created a business plan as a next step to support developing a stewardship program. Based on their sensitivity analysis, using published data from other programs, the proposed return on investment of starting a stewardship program with one clinical pharmacist FTE and one third of an FTE for an adult hematologist averaged around $2 million based on their assessment. And this was the basis of the administrative approval to move forward and appoint clinical leadership for the program. And what we learned from this process that may be beneficial to other institutions aiming to start stewardship programs is that folding factor stewardship into anticoagulation stewardship program responsibilities can help overcome barriers associated with resource constraints because factor stewardship can provide the financial justification needed to, to, to secure program resources. And then these same individuals can be tasked with anticoagulation stewardship responsibilities as well once the program is established. The structure of our program includes two clinical pharmacists and three adult hematologists. I share responsibilities for program oversight from a pharmacy perspective with one other clinical pharmacist, and we divide our clinical time between the two of us on the benign hematology service and the cardiac ICU, such that one of us is responsible for patient care activities for each of these services at all times. Having two of us involved has been very important to help cover vacations and time off on both services, and to just have another person available to help share the workload with and bounce ideas off of has been extremely valuable. The pharmacist on the hematology service at any given time is responsible for attending rounds with the hematology team for patients on our primary service and hematology consult patient discussions as well, and managing day-to-day -day stewardship activities such as fielding requests for restricted blood factor um, medications and reviewing our high-risk high anticoagulant prescribing list that we'll discuss in more detail shortly. 
We also lead our biweekly stewardship meetings where we as a group discuss um, our clinical guidelines, challenging patient cases and other ongoing QI and research projects. We're very fortunate to have three um, of our adult hematologists serve as co-directors for our stewardship program. The role of the physicians in our stewardship group on a day-to-day -day basis is to serve as a resource to myself and my pharmacist counterpart, as well as even other hematology attendings who may be on our inpatient service for challenging stewardship related cases. And on a larger scale, they also serve as physician champions for our stewardship initiatives. And through this help to develop and review our protocols, guidelines, policies, and QI projects. The full implementation process for our program um, has taken several years, and we've found that using a three-phased approach to implementing the program and implementing associated initiatives has been very helpful. Phase one consists of doing a lot of the groundwork for establishing the program, such as developing a business plan, as I mentioned, if needed to obtain financial support, as well as identifying and appointing personnel for the program and having those individuals begin to establish the day-to-day -day structure of program activities. Additionally, a big part of phase one is to define the current state of utilization patterns for agents under the purview of the stewardship program, as this really sets the stage for phase two, which involves identifying and prioritizing targeted interventions to implement. And we'll discuss some examples of targeted interventions that can be considered in just a moment. Phase three involves ongoing quality improvement for the program, including tracking the impact of implemented initiatives. And through this tracking, potentially identifying areas for improvement and education for things you've already implemented and opportunities for future initiatives as well. Some examples of targeted interventions we've implemented in our program at JHH are included in this table. I've separated these into anticoagulation related interventions and clotting factor concentrate related interventions. Next slide, please. There are so many opportunities for stewardship and anticoagulation management, and this list of potential interventions uh, from our program really just scratches the surface of what could be accomplished with implementation of one of these programs. For the sake of time, I will not go through each of these in a lot of detail, but opportunities include developing institutional clinical policies and guidelines for all anticoagulants. We dedicated a great deal of time to establishing clinical guidelines that are available to all staff in our health system on a mobile app or web browser and include not only agent specific dosing and monitoring considerations, but also appropriate and inappropriate indications for use, as well as disease state guidance for conditions such as heparin induced thrombocytopenia. For institutions which use nurse, nurse managed, uh, if you could just go back one slide, uh, for institutions which use nurse managed heparin, Implementing a MAR-based heparin calculator can be considered, which replaces paper nomograms and reduces human error associated with this process. Of course, many institutions, including our own, continue to struggle with HIT stewardship, in particular with inappropriate HIT lab testing. And one step towards improving this at JHH was to develop a HIT clinical decision support tool in our electronic medical record. We recently developed an EMR patient list, which identifies patients with high risk anticoagulation prescribing scenarios. And we'll discuss this in a little more detail on a subsequent slide. Identifying a method to ensure daily pharmacist review of patients receiving therapeutic anticoagulation is very important. Anticoagulation reversal trigger reports can also be a helpful tool to identify inpatients who received anticoagulation reversal agents in order to further assess whether the need for reversal could have potentially been prevented and provide necessary education. And then lastly, evaluating adherence to inst institutional guidelines for VTE prophylaxis prescribing is another important area, which is actually overseen at JHH by a multidisciplinary group separate from our stewardship program. Next slide, please. Examples of clotting factor concentrate targeted interventions include, again, institutional policy and guideline development, as well as formulary management to minimize available formulary agents to only those deemed clinically necessary and the most cost-effective options within each class as well. Establishing an approval process for these agents that involves members of the stewardship team fielding the approval requests as much as possible is also important and has uh, been very helpful at our institution to ensure stewardship principles for these agents are considered when fielding the approvals. Factor concentrate interventions of particular interest to this group include fixed dose PCC administration for warfarin and DOAC reversal, which we've implemented. But as shown here, there are also many interventions to consider for patients with congenital or acquired bleeding disorders as well. Next slide. 
One of the more recent interventions we're most proud of at JHH is the development of a high-risk anticoagulant prescribing patient list. This list was generated due to an unfortunate bleeding event that we felt was preventable had individuals with expertise in anticoagulation been initially involved when treatment decisions were made for the affected patient. The purpose of the list is to proactively identify high-risk medication and patient characteristic combinations so that the anticoagulation regimen can be optimized before an adverse event occurs. This list has continued to evolve quite a bit since we first implemented it several months ago, and now it includes up to 12 criteria that are evaluated for DOACs and about half that number of criteria evaluated for fondaparin and enoxaparin. Example criteria include active orders for DOAX, enoxaparin, or fondaparinux in patients with severe renal impairment, extremes of weight, or with prior ICH or TBI. The purpose of including prior ICH or TBI is to allow assessment of the timing of reintroduction of these agents in these populations. Additionally, we noticed early on in reviewing patients on this list that many patients prescribed apixaban who were um, we were reviewing due to the patient meeting other criteria on the list happened to be prescribed reduced dose apixaban 2.5 BID dosing inappropriately. So we now review all patients on apixaban reduced dosing to ensure that dose is appropriate. Although we aim to review the list every day, unfortunately, that cannot always happen due to other responsibilities. So myself or my pharmacist counterpart review the list two to three times per week at a minimum, and we reach out to the primary team ourselves to make any necessary recommendations. We found this list to be a very important tool to help optimize agent selection and prescribing patterns at our institution. And we think that this has also helped to ensure safe use of these agents. And we're planning to formally characterize the impact of this initiative later this year. I mentioned the purpose of phase three is to track the impact of the program. And through this review at JHH, we found that clotting factor concentrate expenditure was reduced by 1.2 million in the first year after program implementation, and then by an additional 3 million in the second year after implementation. The pharmacist involved, including myself, also tracked cost avoidance in real time for clotting factor concentrate use. And we estimated about $2 million in cost avoidance during our first two years. We as, um, also as a group feel confident that our efforts have helped to improve the quality of care provided to these patient populations, but we've not yet measured this objectively on a large scale. I would be remiss to discuss the successes of the program at JHH without giving credit to the rest of our team listed here, without whom this program would not have succeeded. Additionally, we have many clinicians who carry out the work of the stewardship program in their daily clinical activities, who may not have formal roles in the program, but do provide important contributions to this work on a daily basis. And this program would certainly not be possible without their contributions as well. So stewardship is certainly a team effort. And with that, I'll hand it over to Jory to discuss the program at UAB. Thanks so much, Katie. I think that was a fantastic overview of what a robust stewardship program can look like and how that can function. And I think your program has really been an inspiration for ours. So hopefully for those out there who maybe don't have the type of resources at this point, our discussion is going to focus on, well, where do you get started? How do you build an anticoagulation stewardship program at your institution? And really based on our experience, not that we're experts, but what have we done at UAB? So uh, I included this picture here. This is a picture of our campus at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. Include it here to identify you know, who we are. We are a large academic medical center, about a 1,200 bed hospital. You can see we expand over many city blocks. And so it really, to me, highlights that there's a large institution with many providers that provide anticoagulation related care. And so we had a huge opportunity, but also a huge undertaking in order to try and standardize that and make sure that we could improve safety and appropriateness. Next slide. So I'm going to take us through a couple of lessons that we have learned in this development process. Uh, the first lesson that we learned as we started to build our program was the importance of really understanding the current landscape within our institution. So the first thing we wanted to understand was really who is currently guiding anticoagulation use. And that may vary at your institution. At our institution, we have a couple of organizations that are really vocal in, that, in those anticoagulation related decisions. We have our pharmacy and therapeutics committee. We have a specific subcommittee that's anticoagulation related and they guide um, creation of protocols and guidelines for anticoagulation use. Our Department of Pathology, our blood bank, has actually been historically very active in anticoagulation and hemostatic product related decisions. 
And perioperatively, anesthesia is really uh, driven appropriate use of anticoagulation and even hemostatic products. So then also we asked and tried to understand who at our institution had an interest in anticoagulation use. Who were those stakeholders that we could ultimately engage and use as allies as we tried to start building our program. So importantly, I am a hematologist. So I focus in thrombosis and coagulation, but for our anticoagulation stewardship programs to be successful, we know that there has to be a very vocal and involved pharmacy piece. So finding uh, representatives within pharmacy to partner with was essential. Uh, at our institution, we have a really robust patient safety organization, and we had uh, documented a couple of incidences, as Katie mentioned, at their institution of bleeding-related events. As we know, safety is an issue for anticoagulation, as Dan highlighted, and so partnering with our patient safety folks was also very helpful. And then ultimately, you know, we spent a lot of time trying to find a home for our anticoagulation stewardship program and found an ally in our chief medical officer. So she used to practice as a hospitalist uh, and her clinical experience really helped her to fully understand the need for anticoagulation stewardship. And so she has served as an ally for us as we move our program forward. And then the last thing I think that is helpful for understanding the landscape is to also understand how the antimicrobial stewardship program is structured at your institution. So as uh, Andrea mentioned earlier, right, anticoagulation stewardship was really built uh, based on the structure of antimicrobial stewardship. And so we found that understanding how our antimicrobial stewardship program was structured was really helpful and we could then mirror that structure to build anticoagulation stewardship. And making that comparison was really helpful in trying to explain to people what we were trying to do. So the second lesson uh, was to think about starting small. So we wanted to start with a program that uh, we could do something and measure benefit. So when you're thinking about building an initial project, what should you be thinking about? I would say, you know, for your starting place, really turning to the literature for ideas. Katie's paper that she highlighted is a great example and she listed wonderful areas where they've created interventions. And so turning to the literature to say, hey, what's a project that's worked somewhere else that might work for us? And then I think there's four things that were, we thought about when trying to pick a project. So finding an unmet need, making sure that the project had a manageable scope, making sure it had a manageable, a measurable benefit, and then also ensuring that that benefit aligns with institutional interest. Because the ultimate goal of a small project is that it can then pave the way for bigger projects but we have to make sure that it's consistent with the goals of the institution. So we opted to build a program around uh, the management and the diagnosis of heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. As Katie already mentioned, this is a challenge for most institutions. We have issues with over-testing. Uh, we have issues with the use of direct thrombin inhibitors. At our institution, we primarily use bivalrudin. Um, and these just are patients that tend to be high risk, right? This is a high thrombotic risk condition, but also using high risk anticoagulants. And so we did a survey at our institution of, you know, what was the current status of HIT care? And we found there really was an unmet need. Over-testing was extremely common. Um, in fact, of the patients actually diagnosed with HIT, only 50% of them um, had a consultation with hematology, so someone with a focused expertise in hematologic care. And we currently did not have any sort of regulation for the primary direct thrombin inhibitor that we use, which was bivalrudin. So we had to think, though, about manageable scope. So ideally, we would start, you know, we talk about over-testing, and so the ideal situation is that, well, maybe a program would start at the level of sending that initial screening assay, that ELISA. The challenge is we look to see that our institution was sending about 500 ELISAs per year. Uh, and given this was somewhat of a side project and we wanted to make sure it was something manageable, that was too big of a scope for us. However, we looked at the number of serotonin release assays, those confirmatory assays that were sent per year, it was around 80 to 100, and we had about 20 patients with HIT per year. And so we decided to focus on that group, the SRAs, so if a patient has a positive SRA that we could then intervene. Next slide. And so within, so what we ultimately decided to do was we created what we call an automatic e-consult for any patient that has a positive SRA. So in any patient with significant concern for HIT, we provide uh, guidance on anticoagulation management, interpretation of testing results through an electronic consultation to all of these patients. And again, that's a manageable scope of about 80 to 100 patients per year. And so we did want to focus on, before we inter intervened, what were the things that we were going to measure? What was going to be the benefit that we wanted to demonstrate? We thought that we could improve the stewardship of bivalrudin, so decreasing unnecessary use, 
we actually also thought that we could decrease length of stay in some patients, particularly those with PIT, um, given there has been newer evidence supporting the use of direct oral anticoagulants in these patients, rather than requiring a long course of a direct thrombin inhibitor and ult ultimate transition to warfarin, we thought that perhaps with early incorporation of direct oral anticoagulants, we might then be able to decrease length of stay. And then things that were a little harder always to measure are thrombosis and bleeding, as well as the uh, incidence of medication error related to this patient population, but we wanted to pay attention to those as well. And then lastly, thinking about if the benefits align with institutional interests. And so I'll take you through what that meant, meant for our group and what we learned. Next slide. So our third lesson is learning to speak the language. So as I mentioned, you know, the way we saw this initial project was, first and foremost, an important effort to ensure safety and appropriate care for our patients. But second, that it would be some sort of springboard for us to demonstrate to leadership that our program would be worth investing and that would, it would be able to improve outcomes uh, for patients and for the healthcare system. And so let's say we are looking at our bivalve route in use. So you can see here the, on this graph, we have the days of bivalve route in use on the y-axis, and this is by month. So how many days of bivalve route in were we using as an institution? And you can see after we insulted, uh, inserted our uh, e-consult system, well, we saw a significant decline in the days of use of bivalve rutin, which was fantastic. This was one of our goals. We thought there was inappropriate use. We know that bivalve rutin does come with some increased cost, but also potential for medication error. It's difficult to titrate for nursing. And so uh, next slide. You know, what we learned is talking about days of bivalve rutin use is a little bit too abstract, is not necessarily the language that leadership responded to. Yes, it's great. Yes, it's a, an improvement. We're happy with that. But perhaps it wasn't what would get leadership excited about investing in a program. Next slide. But one of the challenges that are specific to our institution, I'm sure is relevant to many of you, is bed availability. So we are a very large hospital, but we serve a very large area and we are often at capacity. And so there's been a significant focus on how we can optimize care in order to make beds available when people really need them. Next slide. So what really spoke to our leadership was um, how we were able to influence the length of stay of our patients with HIT. So you can see before the e-consult, the median length of stay of our patients were, with HIT was about 27 days. And you see that's the full range um, of length of stay for these different patients. After we implemented our e-consultation service where we provided guidance on anticoagulation management, that median decreased to 12 days. Um, so this was a pretty significant change. And again, this is over one year of implementation. So we saw that improvement. And next slide. And so this was a response that really spoke to our leadership. It aligned with our institutional interests. It spoke the language that they were looking for and has helped us generate excitement and interest in expanding our program. So in conclusion, you know, the lessons that we highlighted today is really, I would consider understanding the landscape at your institution who has an invested interest in anticoagulation management? How is your antimicrobial stewardship program structured? Think about a, pro a project where you can start small. What's an unmet need at your institution, a manageable scope, something with measurable benefit and a benefit that aligns with institutional interest. And think about looking to the literature, particularly Katie's fantastic paper of examples for pro projects that might work for you. And then making sure that you are speaking the language to leadership to then say, this is the reason that it's worth investing in our program. And I'll say this has been a very winding path for us. It has not been uh, straightforward. Um, and I think the importance is that we're really focused on trying to provide excellent anticoagulation care and improve patient outcomes. And as long as we've stayed focused on that goal, we seem to find our way back to the path. Next slide. And I would, of course, like to acknowledge uh, my collaborators in building an anticoagulation stewardship program at UAB. My primary pharmacy partner has been Michael Denneberg, Elizabeth Trupner, Dr. Radhika Gangaraju is another hematologist we work with, and Cody Creekmore is on the administrative side that's been helpful to us. And uh, we have been fortunate to participate in the MIDAS mentoring program through the Anticoagulation Forum with great mentorship from Ann Rose and Dr. Scott Cates, um, who have helped us as we continue to try to build our program. Thank you. Well, thank you to all three of our presenters for giving us such great information and for sharing your experiences. I'd like to highlight a few resources from the AC Forum um, that we have developed to help you in your development of anticoagulation stewardship activities. These three handouts can be found on our website by following the link on the bottom of the screen. 
uh, and they contain potent information you can share with your organization to quantify the impact of stewardship programs. The first, um, the first handout contains information from various organizations like the CDC, the FDA, um, the VA, the Joint Commission, and the National Quality Forum, and their prioritizations of anticoagulation safety and quality. The second handout contains information about specific quality measures like inappropriate DOAC dosing, suboptimal warfarin control, um, and inappropriate ant aspirin anticoagulation uh, combination, and the impact of these measures by implementing stewardship efforts. Uh, the third handout has information about centers who have implemented programs successfully and the cost savings that they have incurred. This is really critical information, folks. Um, I call it a gold mine, um, and it's free. It's available for you to use as you consider how you'll approach your C-suite to campaign for people and for resources um, as you seek to improve the care you provide your anticoagulation patients. Uh, we know the C-suite speaks in dollars. So um, without further ado, I'd like to um, bring back all of our panelists and we're going to get to your questions. Um, we have received a lot of questions in the Q&A box. So we're gonna answer some of those as well as some of the um, questions uh, that came in prior um, to today's presentation. So I think everybody's coming back on. Um, which is great. Thank you all for joining us today. So um, I'll start out with Katie. Um, what are the best first steps for someone who wants to start an anticoagulation stewardship program? Like who do you need to have on your team and how do you incorporate these activities into a staffing model? That's a great question. Um, I think in terms of the, the staff that are necessary to have a successful program, I think having um, hematology attending involvement in combination with pharmacy involvement is something that's proven to be successful in not just our program, but a lot of programs um, uh, across the country. And I think the first step is really to identify whether you have staff that can or will take this on in addition to other responsibilities already, or if you need to identify a way to justify hiring new staff dedicated to this. Um, and then I think, you know, that's kind of, a, that's an important decision point in terms of what the next steps would be. If the latter, identifying the best angle to uh, have your institution take to justify those additional resources would be um, an important early step. If you already have the staff in place, I think, you know, you can just jump right in and take a close look at your practice patterns and identify things that you'd like to improve upon and, and prioritize. Yeah, can, can I just add to that a little bit, Katie? I agree. But I think the really issue is, is, and it's one of our core elements also, is that you have to have find someone with passion. And so I agree, most of the time that will be hematologists because that's where a lot of people look. But if you go to Loma Linda, you want Alan Jacobson, uh, who's a cardiologist uh, doing this because that's where the uh, passion is. Uh, you know, Elaine Heilig's an internist, but you couldn't find a better, more passionate person on the globe uh, for this uh, type of thing. So I think it really depends on, you know, who you have, uh, you know, uh, at your institution to uh, get a hold of. Yeah, that's a great point, Scott. It's, it's important to find um, the people uh, who are interested in this and who are going to drive it. So um, I'd like to direct the next question to Jory. Um, what specific benchmarks or metrics do you think are important to track success? And what are potential challenges with measuring and analyzing these metrics? Um, are there things like um, technology issues that you guys have encountered or um, other things that make it a challenge? Well, that's a great question. I think is the kind of inherent challenge of all of this is we want to be able to monitor and demonstrate benefit, but how do we do that effectively? So the first part of the question, I guess, is thinking about what metrics to follow. Uh, you know, I'd reference back to my slides, really thinking about what is the language that you need to speak in order to, you know, where do you want to go? Um, so if you already have resources and you can kind of focus on, you know, any problem, that's fantastic. But I think a lot of us are going to find ourselves kind of starting small and trying to find metrics that are um, speak best to the C-suite. And so as Andrea mentioned, unfortunately, some of that is financial. And so that's why we uh, were very, we felt length of stay was helpful. Katie demonstrated partic particularly with hemostatic factors, looking at financial benefit. Um, 
those things uh, are, are the metrics that we find to be helpful. I think at the same time, I also like to collect clinical metrics that you know, fuel my passion for patient care, right? So that decrease in bivalent use brings me joy. Um, I think it's really appropriate. So um, I think it's a combination of those things that make a good metrics. And then the second question, part of the question was how to collect those things. That's a, that's a challenge as well. You know, I think uh, working with uh, informatics at your institution to try and find out what can be collected automatically versus what has to be collected manually is really important. Uh, the reality that we found is that, unfortunately, manual collection is often required. And I think Katie referenced that, you know, you, you calculate your own financial benefit, which is challenging that you have to spend time doing those things, but that's the reality. But I do think that we have been able to sit down. We work with Cerner, so it depends on your medical record. Um, I will say through the anticoagulation forum, we actually recently met with Allison Burnett to talk about how they're collecting some data because they're also on Cerner. So I think partnering with folks and reaching out to people who have created any sort of automatic data collection is really powerful, but recognizing that you're probably going to have to do some manual collection too, but just trying to be very deliberate about how you have to do that so you're not spending too much time just collecting data. Andrea, if I can just add quickly too, I think when you're thinking about putting together like a stewardship program, I think one of the areas that's often not thought about is engaging your IT program right away. So making sure you get somebody tied in so that they can hear all of your discussions of this is the programs we want to implement. These are the outcomes we want to measure right from the start so that they hear these conversations and they can start working on how do I build then this reporting into whatever you know, health um, records you have. Yeah, absolutely. And if I could just uh, do a follow on to that. And then if you're wrestling between three or four measures and you know they're all you think will have similar impact on C-suite or to your passion, like Jory uh, mentioned, grab the one that you can measure easiest. Uh, and you have to have IT there at the beginning to be able to tell you which is the easiest to measure. Absolutely, absolutely. Because you know we always have to think about sustainability. Um, when I was doing my, uh, my doctoral thesis um, on home INR testing, we were trying to uh, measure therapeutic time and range. And, you know, it's great if you need to, to calculate this, you know, just on a one-time thing, but you want to be able to, to create something that you can continue to measure. That's the idea of quality improvement. It's not just like, hey, let's do this program and then we'll be done with it in six months. It's how do we create sustainability long-term? So, yeah, thanks for your thoughts on that, everybody. Um, I'm going to direct the next question over to Mike. Um, how do we best engage hospital administration for inpatient antithrombosis stewardship programs. Um, how do we convince them to fund additional FTEs? Are there specific resources uh, we can use to justify the additional FTEs? Yeah, so I, I can, I'll just refer back to what uh, Katie said about our program is that in the beginning, we, you know, we had hematology leadership involved, we had pharmacy leadership involved, Katie and I and others got together to look at what would be things that leadership would respond to. Um, and it comes down to dollars, really, as everyone else has said. <laughs> and then looking at areas where there, were, there was low hanging fruit. In our case, it was factor products, really, that could support the whole program, even though you know, half of our initiatives, maybe more than half of them have been in the NF thrombotic arena, but it's the factor product spend that we've really been able to impact on where we collapsed our whole inventory. We had half a dozen or more factors on, on in our inventory. Now we have a couple. We have focused on just a, a few factor products that are economical that have saved us a lot of money. Also focused on areas where we were spending a lot of money on Novo 7. We we're spending huge amounts of money, uh, you know, treating in some cases inappropriately using that factor product. And so I think finding out where you're spending, you know, doing an inventory, finding out where you're spending your money so that you can Put together a business plan that'll support this whole structure, and that's uh, you know that you know getting together with leadership and the people where, that have that data is the way to do it. And so that you know, and IT of course is involved in that. Yep. Mike, I'm sorry. Another follow-on to that. So, folks, I, I, I've seen this movie a long, long time ago when we built an outpatient anticoagulation clinic. 
And at that time, everybody was building them differently. They all looked a little different. The concept was the same. We we're all picking what little thing we had to do, which administrator we could do to find support and to do that until that became really sort of the standard or at least best uh, practice. I think now we see the same thing because we've mostly concentrated on inpatient in this discussion today. I think where we are where outpatient anticoagulation clinics were 25 years ago with this stewardship model here for uh, inpatient. And so a, a lot of it is, I say, think, the same building steps, different measures, um, of course, but sort of same concepts. That's true. I mean, the, the team we used for building this inpatient program was the same team as we yeah. used for our AC clinic, you know, the same people involved. I mean, it's, uh, the leadership people that we had involved in putting that together that program. So you're absolutely right. You use the same model. Absolutely. Uh, thanks for your thoughts on that. Um, I, I'm going to, I'm going to go to Dan. We haven't, we haven't heard from you in a little bit of time. So um, uh, we had a great question actually from Jeff Barnes um, when we were working on developing this, uh, this presentation, how do epidemiology papers like this come to be? Um, what's the methodology that's used um, and what's your perspective on that? Yeah, well, well th thank you for the question. And, and I think the short answer is FB papers like these, they're nationally representative uh, that broadly look at like a whole host of uh, health issues, or in this case, adverse drug events are really hard to get data for. Uh, it, you know, um, and they, they are hard to come by because making that link between an adverse event and the cause is something that people don't generally like to write about. They don't generally don't, don't like to put in a code. Uh, there are billing codes for any coagulant, for example, related adverse events, but they're rarely, really rarely used. So, you know, th th these particular data happen to be a uh, national surveillance program that, that, that the CDC runs, but I think there is an ability to do local programs uh, in this anti-coagulation safety sphere. Uh, we did work to validate some bleeding codes uh, that can be used uh, to identify patients who bleed among a cohort of patients that are being managed uh, like with anticoagulants. So again, it's working with your IT department, selecting those patients that uh, are, are being anticoagulated, and then looking for some of these bleeding codes, comparing groups or, or trending over time is something one can do at a local level. But again, to back, back to the original question, doing these uh, studies uh, at a national level are hard to do. For example, the Inspector General report, they only do that once every decade. <laughs> it shows you how hard it is to do. Um, and, and so the short answer is that they're hard to do, but um, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. We appreciate it. It's, it's so much work, um, but I think the data that we get from these is remarkable and it really supports all of us who are on the front lines um, with gaining staff with gaining um, resources to do what we do every day. And so we appreciate um, the work that you've done with the CDC to, to get all of this out to us on the front line. So yeah, and, and then I'll just add one final comment, which is I Please. appreciate the work that, that the folks are doing to, to translate these data into action, because that's really what, what needs to happen to actually affect patients. So, so thank you for all this work that you all are doing that stewardship and, and, and folks who are attending uh, We'll be barking on it. Hopefully. Yeah. Hopefully, in the next few years, maybe we'll see anticoagulants down the list. What a success that would be. So, um, Anne. Just, uh, Dan, go, it's go ahead. It's interesting to me that, you know, because all of us as taxpayers have paid for the data and the studies and the work that the CDC uh, does and all the dedication for all the folks in uh, uniform that uh, and the skill they bring and passion to bring this together. Yeah, sometimes we don't use it. And I've never sort of understood why we have this great resource that we've all bought and yet we don't do anything with it. So thanks for bringing a highlight to this really important work. Um, so Anne, I'm going to toss it over to you next. Um, so you've, you know, been in, involved with stewardship efforts and been on the mentor side of things. Um, do you see any plans for development of anti of outpatient anticoagulation stewardship programs? Um, we know that most of the work recently has been focused on inpatient, but how about outpatient? And as kind of tagging onto that, how can the outpatient team support the inpatient team? Um, particularly with like transitions of care and things like that. 
Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I, I think when we are thinking about anti-coag stewardship, we really should be thinking about it from a holistic standpoint, meaning inpatient, outpatient, really any area of, of care where your patient could potentially have an antithrombotic agent given, reversal agent given. Um, the program that we set up here at the University of Wisconsin is just that. It is all-encompassing, if you will. Um, there's a lot of support that, that both can provide one another, right, especially with communication on transitions of care from inpatient to outpatient. I feel like that's really an area where a lot can be missed or dropped when patients are transitioning between that inpatient outpatient setting. Um, so having, you know, an, an electronic system that can do that communication, can talk to each other is huge. And so when you're creating your programs, you know, thinking about that, how can that um, augment um, and, and better, you know, with, uh, better provide patient care in that transition part. Um, I think when we think about anti-coag clinics specifically, I know we often think about that being sort of a little mini stewardship, but when we're thinking about DOACs now, especially with what Dan presented, where, you know, DOACs are becoming and surpassing warfarin in, in some of our ED visits and bleeding events, you know, we need to think about how do we best apply stewardship concepts to DOAC patients. I know there's been a lot of great work done at the VA, University of Michigan, with creating uh, dashboards and, and ways to approach these patients from like more of a population health standpoint. And so I think there's a lot of um, a lot of growth that can happen from an outpatient stewardship setting. Yeah, a lot coming down the pipeline. So very exciting things. Um, Katie and Jory, um, did any of your anticoagulation stewardship efforts involve pediatrics? Um, we do have a few pediatrics folks um, that have chatted into the Q&A box, and we want to make sure we we uh, we think about that population as well. For the the program at JHH, um, we have largely focused on adult initiatives, although some of the things that we've done have impacted pediatric um, patient populations as well as kind of a downstream effect. So at those decision points, we've had to you know, loop in our pediatric colleagues to make sure that they're on board with some of the um, changes we've been making to the formulary and things like that. Um, I think it it would be great if, if our pediatric group had the resources to kind of um, to have dedicated staff for our stewardship program, but that's really been the, the, the largest barrier for them at this point, given that we um, did not have any funding set aside for pediatric hematology um, physician or pharmacist involvement when the business, initial business plan was created. And I'll add um, at our institution as well, this is an adult effort and I've spoken with colleagues in pediatrics. I think the challenge, unfortunately, well, fortunately is that they don't use a lot of anticoagulation, right? Children, fortunately, don't get as much thrombosis. Um, and fortunately, kids tend to do well, which is great, um, but does make it a little bit harder to justify, um, you know, it's harder to make that financial argument. So I think that's a common issue that pediatric providers with a focus in hematology and anticoagulation are dealing with. Um, and I think it's something that has been discussed in a couple of meetings that I've been in with the anticoagulation forum. It might be an area to continue to expand to think about how we can provide resources specific to the pediatric population because it is certainly unique. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you both for your thoughts on that. Um, I think we have time for one more quick question. I'm going to direct it to Scott just as a wrap up. Um, this, the, the AC Forum is just a, a wonderful organization. I just feel so privileged to be a part of it. Um, and what is AC Forum doing from an organizational stand, standpoint to support uh, anticoagulation stewardship efforts? And, you know, there's been a, a repeated question, is there mentoring available um, for those who want to start um, stewardship programs at their organization? Is there resources available? Um, what do you have from us from AC Forum? Yeah, well, thanks to the board about five, six years ago, we uh, started this uh, journey. Um, we started that and we were lucky enough to get a um, FDA grant in which we built the core elements. So I would review those core elements. That's going to give you a foundation of what you should do and how you should do a stewardship program. Through our second one that you've heard with this MIDAS program, we had five uh, groups that we mentored. So we've done proof of concept that you can build this. Jory gave an excellent presentation of 
how you start to get to the beginnings to, so you can end up where uh, Mike and Katie um, are. And Anne has a spectacular stewardship program in place for many years also. And then we have a, a, a current application in again for our third step. We'll see if uh, we get uh, funded on sort of how you can sort of build a tool, this dashboard that you've really heard about a little bit. So we're taking this journey step by step at a time, just like you would start small and keep layering on uh, to see if we can show a model and tools on how to do this. But again, the centers of excellence, you, you uh, Andrea, you showed three things. Start there. There's lots and lots of information uh, that we have available. And it's, of course, all for free. Thanks so much, Scott, and thanks so much to all of our presenters. And I'm going to turn it over to Liz, who's going to wrap up with a few last minute items. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Wow, what an amazing, important discussion. I think we could go on for hours based on the numbers of questions coming in. I want to thank all of our speakers for your incredible work highlighting the problem with adverse drug events associated with anticoagulants and developing these wonderful programs to improve care. Thank you to Drs. Dan Butnitz, Katie Dane, Mike Strife, and Jory May for your great work. Love how you described your programs, and I'm sure it will help lots of other people. Thank you to Ann Rose and our amazing past president, Scott Cates, for your mentoring and expert guidance. And thank you, Andrea, for leading this webinar and for your excellent moderating. As both Andrea and Scott said, the AC Forum is very proud of our work to advance anticoagulation stewardship. And I'm excited to share, I think Andrea mentioned it, that we'll be publishing a playbook providing practical guidance on how to create and sustain an anticoagulation stewardship program. The playbook is being developed in partnership with the National Quality Forum and will be available for free in September. So please stay tuned on that. Um, as Andrea said, the beginning of this program is accredited. It's accredited for nurses, pharmacists, and physicians. And the link is on our website and also in the chat. Um, as usual, this program has been recorded and will be posted on our website in a few days along with the slides. So thank you for sharing the slides to all the speakers. Please join us at our next webinar on Wednesday, July 20th. Jory May and Andrea will be back and um, they'll be discussing unexplained arterial thrombosis. You can register for this webinar on AC Forum's website. Lastly, I just wanna highlight that the AC Forum has published updated COVID guidance responding to all the questions that we got from membership. So it has, oops, sorry. It has 30 distinct recommendations based on your questions and it is available for free as well. AC Forum is committed to making all these resources free to our members. Um, please save the date for our national conference that we are, well, can't guarantee anything, but really hoping to be <laughs> in person in April in San Francisco. And lastly, I'd like to thank our corporate sponsors for supporting this webinar. Thank you so much to all of our speakers for everyone taking time out of your day to join us. And we'll see you next month. Thank you.